Hello, welcome. Um, we are here today in the Park House, and uh, it's for the program that is organized by Afrospectives, and it's under the umbrella of Arts and Resistance, and it's funded by the IFCA, the Amsterdam Culture Funds, and this session is also uh, recorded, so if you would like to participate, please um, tell us so we do not record you. Anyways, my name is Musoke Naruoga, and uh, I am an artist, curator, and general cultural maker on the Amsterdam art scene. And for me, this conversation is a very interesting one because I'm sitting among people who are very much busy with creating and mining histories that are black, creating black perspectives, creating portals through which black people can reinvent and re-see themselves, at least within the European context. Anyways, um, the first thing I would like to do is maybe talk about what this um, panel wants to do. This panel is talking about creating, taking on our own history and telling it from our own perspectives, right? But what this panel is also doing is it has brought three geniuses um, to be in conversation. So we would like to dive into their practices and we would like to give them space to have the conversation, to deepen it, to really understand what their practices are and how they see their practices out there in the world and how we could maybe ourselves take a lesson or two from them. Meaning that we are not really going to center any perspectives that are not those of minority groups. So if you feel that you are um, very privileged, please take a listening position within this panel. And uh, yeah, I'm genuinely excited for this. I would like to ask um, you to introduce yourself. Hello. I don't usually get to do that, so let's see. How much time do we have? <laughs> okay, I, I will be brief. Uh, my name is Jennifer Tosh, and I'm honored to be invited to be a part of this discussion with this distinguished uh, group. Um, I'm one of the founders of the uh, Mapping Slavery Project, of co-founder of Sites of Memory Foundation, which is what I refer to as history theater, uh, using performance as um, a voice of activism and also of shifting the gaze and talking about perspectives, of looking at uh, history. I've co-written three books, and so the starting point for our project was really the research that had been done by the Mapping Slavery Project and other scholars and curators and um, you know makers, if you will, co-creators. I'm also the founder of Black Heritage Tours in Amsterdam. Uh, next year will be our 10-year anniversary which is about centering the hidden stories and making those stories become more visible from an African perspective. Uh, I was born in New York. My family all comes from Sudanama. Uh, my parents, my ancestors, six generations, four generations of my family are from the Netherlands. I am born in New York, the first generation American born. So I have a lot of different histories and uh, geographies that, that I travail. Tra Hi everyone, my name is Emma Leon Ponsa. I have recently become a doctor of communication science. Sorry, I just wanted to put it out there. Um, so I'm a researcher and I work around topics of blackness, media and technology, knowledge production, um, retelling stories. Um, and in addition, I'm also one half of Black Seas Back, which is um, Oh, that's what it says. Awesome. <laughs> um, well, it's um, a media platform, um, a production house, and we kind of want to highlight the narratives, untold narratives of people of African descent in Belgium and the Netherlands. And we have made several films, short films. And what we basically want to do is kind of um, think about how we can create collectively and that's an ongoing dialogue that we're having, an ongoing um, exercise. And um, I'm excited to be here. My name is Omar Mbeng Atokoso. I'm from Senegal. I grew up in France. I studied there. Uh, I lived there as an artist. I moved to the Netherlands 
to live and work, and I studied here as well. But from visual artists, I've become a pluridisciplinary artist. Let's say meter en scène. And uh, the last uh, 20 years, I've been working with the postmodern immigrant. Till 2019, I became the director of uh, Africa in the Picture. It's a film festival in Amsterdam. And the, the festival has a transition. It's not only film festival, but there is an educational platform called Document Yourself, and a business platform as well, we call Business Intelligent <coughs> Platform of African Startup, and a Café Literaire. Because, you know, we, I think it was very necessary to extend our field of function in order to, to be more accessible and to communicate, to inform, to reach certitude and universality, which is uh, really interesting. And I'm pleased to be here tonight. With her. Gorgeous. Thank you so much. Um, you've heard from the speakers. Um, maybe I'll say the date today. It's the 9th of December and it's 2022. We're going towards the end of the year. And what I would like, especially when I was thinking with this program, the first thing I thought, oh, actually we have been in the institute, we've been outside the institutions. We had BLM, we've entered the institutions, we've made our own institutions, and now here we are, right? This is the timeline, this is the context in which we find ourselves. And within this entering, instituting, deinstituting, being on the outside, creating a protest, resisting, working within the margins, I would like to pose the first question. Ready. Go. <laughs> um, so like, how was the commodification of art from um, the African diaspora affected or worked on the ways and methods in which you function? to unpack, isn't it? Um, I think I want to start by saying the challenge we're going to have as a collective is language. Because immediately what we're always confronted with is the language that we use to describe ourselves and our work is still colonized language, right? So the, it's difficult when we talk about the commodification because then you have to go back really in time to when did that really begin? How did that that institutionalization of the black body gets framed to begin with. So when I talk about the commodification of the work that I do, it's about labor and value. So the, one of the things I'm always confronted with is putting enough value on the work that I do that has, that has a social good, and how then does that get translated? Because institutions will consume everything that we produce. They've done it for centuries, they being white, you know, white dominant society. So in terms of commodification, I also am aware of not reproducing the same violence that that has created for centuries as well. So it's a very fine line that we're trying to walk, I think, uh, all of us in some way. And yet, and still seeing that the value that I have has a price and that I should not be ashamed or embarrassed or feel any sort of kind of way for asking for what I'm worth. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question in some way. <laughs> in some way, yes. I mean, maybe I would like for you to engage with the same question. It's a tough one because, I mean, there are so many layers, but I think it's important to ask ourselves who we are creating for, um, especially since BLM, you mentioned BLM, and I wondered whether we have been very visible um, or whether we have been more visible since BLM, because I think we've been less visible actually in, in institutions. Um, I mean, we've been visible in different ways. I think we've been on brochures much more than we've ever been before, but we're not really, you know, the our interior worlds and narratives and our fullness is, is not as, uh, as much displayed as our bodies are. Um, so this is, I think, something that we have to critically look at and maybe think about um, what we want as a collective or as a people. Um, do we want to be liberal about our existence or do we like, um, and, and that comes with the, the threat, of, threat of being 
taking the place of the oppressor as well. Like sometimes, you know, just there's space for just one black person and then, you know, this um, false competition that institutions create um, between us or do we want to be radical and want to uh, be um, unapologetic about, you know, our presence and keep the door open for other people or, you know, maybe just create our own stuff, create our own spaces um, so we can show up in our fullness. I think those are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. And I mean, I guess there's a much, much more to say, but it's the beginning. Omar, please engage with the same question. Yeah, with the same question. Because we, I always uh, uh, approach situation with the eye of, um, let's say, artists outside. So anywhere I get at the first time, the, only, the first thing I will do is to identify myself in the place and to be able to identify the place itself. And if every place has an identity, which is religious identity, cultural identity, political identity, it's religious identity, and so on. And I always look at what's missing for me, personally, to create my own space. That's why I, when we talk the issue of uh, institutions, I, all, I happen to create my own institutions, which is the Museum of Immigration. It was really difficult to set it up, but since we know that the, the virtual is very accessible, so I, I created there and to begin with, which is important. Yeah. Interesting. Instituting and deinstituting. Maybe I come back to, the, to this question with you, Jennifer, because what Umar is talking about is quite interesting, right? this idea of getting out and creating your own institution. Yes? Because you said Jennifer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive my sins. I'm talking to you. Um, sorry, I will be listening more carefully. Then. I'm sorry. OK, maybe I forgot. I was listening say. carefully because she did say my name, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. Good, Forgive me. I'm taking over from Guion, and I love the topic, but I'm new in it, at least for tonight. Anyways, I wanted to ask about this idea of non taking on the oppressor's role, right? Because in this way, like when I talk about the consumption of black, black creativity, black personhood within institutions, it's also a very white way of doing things. A lot of uh, BIPOC do not wish to extract, right? So how do we create from the outside? How do we create our own institutions, which I know you've all done, and then not extract, right, within these processes of consumption? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want to say that I've created my own institution. I don't, maybe my understanding of institution is is, is different from yours because I see institutions that's very much grounded in the structures of society and I don't have that means. <laughs> um, so my organization is definitely not an institution but perhaps an infrastructure to do things for people. Um, sorry, could you, <laughs> could you go over you the question? How have you your infrastructure to affect the ways that you are consumed as a black creator, right? Yeah, I think it's it's been tricky because, I mean, it's also very practical. You wanna create things, you wanna be idealistic about things, but you also wanna pay people, you wanna make sure that, every, that there are enough means to kind of distribute and give people what they deserve. And oftentimes people get a lot more money and means when they are in bigger institutions, established institutions. And that's not something that I can offer with my organization. So from the start, I am very open and intentional about you know, the, the way we work. It's, um, we try to distribute as much as possible, but also really um, work in a way that that is collective and whatever comes out of it everybody will um get something out of that for instance we made this film euphoria and that was like a super low-key um project but then the people who were uh, involved um are now 
filmmakers, models are doing music, so they have been picked up just by you know having this film distributed in different places that are meaningful, that can be meaningful for them. And then that's the question of, okay, so now they are in institutions, but we could have, I guess, it's, it's good for them, and we could have helped them to, to be noticed in that way. Um, but then the question remains, do we want to end up in institutions? But I guess everybody has to make that decision for themselves. But yeah, that's what I try to do, um, to create that space for people to explore. Um, and by leaving space for people to explore, that means that we don't give them a script. Um, I mean, I guess an institution invites people and also expects very, um, I mean, demarcated and results, and that's not necessarily what we do, so maybe it grants people a bit more freedom in terms of um, creativity. Perfect, thank you so much. I'm going to um, glitch the conversation a little bit because I think a better first question would have been, in which ways are you um, creating and taking ownership or helping other people take ownership of African history through your practice, through your organization? And I think this question goes for all of you. I think it's a nice base to land on. Well, I started um, Black Heritage Tours 10 years ago just to what you said about something was missing. Something in my own story was missing. Something in my family's stories were missing. Uh, coming from the US, I had a very strong foundation in sort of race history of obviously living through many generations of that. And when I came here, I found that that was absent. So this whole notion of the first, one of the first things I was confronted with is, oh, well, we don't do race. Oh, the Netherlands is colorblind. We don't see color. And I thought, well, that's just not, that makes no sense. Or, oh, racism is an American problem. You know, it came over here from the US. And so that was problematic. And what was missing for me was the other side of the story. There were no, you know, in terms of identity and belonging, I, I, my own family has been here four generations but didn't feel like they belonged. They were not citizens or claiming citizenship. Oh no, we're not Dutch. Well, you have a Dutch passport. What, what determines identity, going back to your notion of the vertical and the horizontal, your identity then is somewhere else but you've been here for generations. So I was very confused by that notion. Fast forward, the tours um, was a way of, of of history telling, but a way of also centering the hidden and making it more visible. And it's always been about trying to create not an institution as much as a platform, a space, a safe space where we could center ourselves, we can define who we are, we can share those stories. A lot of secrets have come out on the tours. People feeling that, okay, maybe this is a good place to say that, by the way, my ancestors were enslaved or the enslaver. I mean, I never know what's gonna happen. It's, that's what I think when you make it an open space, not make it so definitive that it has to be a script that I read from and you have to just listen and consume what I say. I want it to be a dialogue. The same thing happened with Sites of Memory. Katie Strake and I, who's a theater maker and I being a culture historian, came together, we sat in the same office space, she experienced my tour and said, wow, wouldn't it be great to put that to performance as a, not an act of resistance, as much as an, another a platform for communication among languages, uh, different cultures, different identities, to come together and create something that speaks back to history. Yeah, I like that idea. Let's try that. And so that's where we started seven years ago. And I think what we've tried to do is make it not um, an institution, but that has, it has a legacy and it's sustainable that it can live on if we die, it doesn't just disappear because that's the problem with things that we tend to create from the diasporic perspective is that it has a very short life. And if those who created it are no longer a part of it, it disappears. And how do we make it so that it's sustainable, that it can continue, the next generation can pick it up and move forward with it? Well, interesting, I hope I will have uh, added value about uh, your rhetoric, yeah. which is, uh, but just allow me to rewind and play before I play, because I was born in Senegal, and I'd never faced any sense of racism or any obstacle of citizenship regimes. Mm. 
And when I arrived in France, they never called me black artist or black maker. I was an artist. But it's here they call me African artist, which was uh, really, I say, okay, it's a sense of portraying me or it's ignorance and, and I had to deal with that, go through it. I was really comfortable with myself because I, I knew who I was, because I know all the personality, all the individuals in me, what they represent. And where I was as well, where I will be, I was chosen to be here because I'm a migrant, not a refugee. I decided to come here. So at that moment, I, you know, the sense of my memory trans, I mean, migrate to this, the anthropology of the present, which is very important to analyze the society where you are and what you're dealing with to educate myself and come back to the institutions. It's, it's a collective structure you create because, of course, there is a missing of accessibility, of being accepted, being rejected, you know, or, oh, don't worry, we want to help you. I heard it. <laughs> they called me to bring my artwork and I refused. I said the condition, they said, no, we want to help you. Oh, and I, it's very funny. I spoke with my brother. He said, they don't know you but you know them. It means uh, the issue of the diaspora, what the diaspora is facing, I never face it, but I learn and to identify myself as, as one of them, which is really uh, important, which is not my identity at all. This is a sense of uh, ability of absorption, to adapt myself in situation in order to, to perform in collective. Yeah. yeah. And how you perform in collective, I will come back to the third space. Here is a neutral space. Who you are is not important. You bring what's really interesting about you, what is performative, in order to allow the, how do you say, the fluid interaction to expose yourself, to inspire maybe, and to learn, which is a long way to go. Because, and when we talk about central black maker or black, you know, we have to define it that you, it's not black from continent, but it's black universal. And with all what is represented in one circumstance like in this area of Western civilization. Can I just say something? What I think really for me resonates with that is I found that particularly when I came to the Netherlands, there's this incessant need to place you. You have to belong somewhere for us to be able to know how to deal with you, to control you. So I found myself having to constantly answer the question, okay, you're American. Well, that's, that's, that's an almost a pass. So you're allowed to do certain things as an American. Or, so when will you go back? Or are you black? Are you, you know, there's a need to try to place you, which I, I found rather irritating at times because I, why do you need to place me? Why do you need to position me? Let me position myself and then you'll understand the work that I'm doing versus the other way around. It's about trying to control the narrative. I, I don't want you to know what I'm going to say. I don't need you to validate what I'm doing. I don't need the money from the government, which is another thing. Well, are you getting funded from the, the government? No. Well, how do you do this? Because I know how to do it. <laughs> you know, that this was, I found, very, very much, a, um, it's not just a European identity, but very much a Dutch identity, that this need to constantly have to position you in order for you to then be a, given permission to, as if that's what you needed to do. And I think what I love about the works that that you all have done or are doing, that we're doing, is that we're not asking for permission. Why do we need permission? It is, it is because we decide that's what it needs to be. And the more that we can own our own narratives and tell our own stories and know who we are, as you say, and, and not have to be worried about the rejection or acceptance, because in the beginning, my own family said, well, no one's ever going to buy that. No one's ever going to do a tour. Dutch people are never going to let you say those things. And who's going to give you money for that? So just the self, you know, just accepting oneself as valid enough to have something to say and that it is consumable 
and not worry about any repercussion. Like, oh, you're going to get us kicked out of the country. My brother, who probably is watching, and hates that he ever said that. You're going to get us deported. And you've been here four generations. You're worried about deportation? You see the thinking that's still very much that we have to try to unpack all of that. Interesting. Thank you so much. I'm going to return to Ampol, sir, because I think maybe we need a little summary of what your institution does. I feel we haven't gotten that one yet. OK, so very practically what we do. Um, so in, so we were we are founded in Belgium. Um, and we are, because I'm Dutch, a Belgo-Dutch platform, meaning that we facilitate dialogue, conversation between black people, people who are categorized as black, uh, in Belgium and the Netherlands. And we started out with panel conversations, recorded them in a way that could be easily distributed because especially in Belgium, those conversations were not happening at all. Um, and slowly but surely, we started to experiment with more creative um, material, creative content, and that's how we started making movies, short films experimental things, um, video essays, um, things like that. So it's really focused on creating video content. Um, yeah, so that's what we do. I wanted to add something maybe because I completely feel that we're kind of here also positioned as you know black people even though our stories are so different from each other. And you've you talked, well, you've talked about memory and untold stories, uncovering these um, hidden histories, and you talked about you know be basically becoming black when coming to Europe, um, and having to teach yourself about you know the various codes and cues and signifiers of I guess blackness, and that turns us into a collective. And I've a collect I've conceptualized this this idea um, in my dissertation as black cultural memory. And then I think it really corresponds with what we're doing here. We're creating black cultural memory. And it's important that this is a place where we create from. So it's not a blackness that was assigned to us, um, but it is a blackness that we created ourselves um, based on our actual histories, but also based on our collective histories that we may not have gone through ourselves necessarily, but it's just like a symbolic um, part of us and i think that's um yeah i just wanted to 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 kind of tie this all together <laughs> thank you i like it i must say like i have a friend who told me that actually between ourselves most black people we don't know each other's like uh, particular histories you know what i mean like when I talk about like uh, the people from Suriname, I don't think I have spent a lot of time diving into like Surinamese history. I don't think a lot of people have dived into Ugandan history. So in a way, like um, the idea of coming to Europe or being born into Europe, you also are born into this kind of like diaspora pan-Africanism that is like particularly European. So I like that uh, line of thought. I wanted to also talk about the idea of what is gained in being in diaspora and what is lost in being in diaspora, right? And when I talk of being in diaspora, I do not mean as in the arrival after you have had a life where else, but really the transience of being in diaspora. Yeah, uh, diaspora is... Uh, Diaspora doesn't have a choice to exist. It is there. Yeah. And the sense of gaining and lose is more related to migrations about refugees as well. And when you make the sociology of the, of the present, like in my work, once we have a, a projection into the future, it's a dreaming perspective to have better life or to have better position. In my case, I was, I'm almost from Dakar. I didn't come to Europe to look for money. I was here to look, you know, to make art because all what I wanted to do is art. I was really mad about art. But once I get in, there I become migrant. And once I become migrant, it's the vertical form because I was 
I went through situation of uh, documentation to be legal or illegal, to have uh, access to to education or to work, you know, and there we can evaluate what we gain and what we lose. Once we settle, let's say settle, but what we gain does it replace what we lose? And this is a, a continuous recurse about the research of uh, postmodern immigrant because it's endless because you're going to reproduce yourself. And once you reproduce yourself, you're going to have a projection into what your, your reproductions, all what you're missing about your journey as migrant. We have to understand something which is very important in the period of migrations, which is some of my friends, I start to make, to give workshop about uh, documenting yourself because there is a gap between the 20 years time in order to understand where you are, in order to get the job done. And once some of us happen to anticipate that moment, we have to be able to share the information in order to, to allow the others to just anticipate because it's all is organized to block you not intentionally because we talk about institutions, all what you're going through, which is really very interesting. And at the end, yeah, it's very interesting to see this because you know, when we talk about pyramid, it's really used ambition. But for us, this is what it represents. You know, you might be meeting anybody in the street as a migrant, as a black person, but you don't have a clue. You don't have no ideas about the battle the ambitions and the content of resources which is boiling there and yeah thank god i i love art because any circumstances i really try to transform it into conceptual tools in order to establish form of allegories in order to look at myself to see myself and when it's really beautiful and interesting i share it the sense of presentation i don't represent because just allowed me to explain you one anecdote because when I went to Senegal after 12 years of absence, I joined the academy. I didn't know that they were moving to Senegal. They took me home and they say, you are not going to stay in your house. You will stay with us. I said, no, because my grandmother will say, I come with a white woman, so I don't want to join home. The, purpose, the deal was I invite them in my house, my traditional house. I invite all the Europeans to really show who am I, in order to allow them to have access to me. What I did, I opened the most intimate area in my civilization, in my house, is the sacred wood, where we put our intimacy. And this moment, I didn't know what I was doing, I was just being open, but they told me, now we see who you are. In Europe, you are just like a European, but in Africa, you're a real nigger, you're real Africans. Could they see me with my bracelet, bare feet, and making my rituals and so on? That's why to spend, you know, the multiple content in human existence, in human being, which is really important to bring into the institutions. But what do we institutionalize? That's really very important. Yeah, to be accessible, to allow to be accessible. But the other, like, excuse me, Europeans, they must be able to expose themselves as well, which is important. Because most of the time when we get together, we are talking. We talk our pain, our story, our identity, they listen. And which is important, which is very interesting constat. Why they listen? Because, yeah, there is some kind of trauma there which we share. And you can find it from the essay of Frank Fano, Omi Baba, and so on. They explain us a lot of situations where we can really look at and update ourselves, which is important. I'm going to keep you talking a little bit further because maybe I want to bring it to a place that is a bit more material. What has happened to your art in transit? What has happened to it 
as you left Senegal and brought it to Europe? Oh, I didn't bring my artwork to Europe. When I get here, I make artwork. It's just like when I was in the academy, they called me tourist. I never make work. I was only hanging there. I listen, I read artwork. When I came to Europe, I just came for as a residency in Fijac, the downtown Paris in France. And I start to make really physical objects. Yeah. And all what I have made, I brought my work, the anthropological research, which was really anthropological, uh, anthropomorphic and esitopies, based on the half circle that we used to, to express the human body, which is, we, my personal experience is to end up with less mumble. You know, those works are really attached to me. I brought them here. But since I get here, I baptize myself. I analyze the, I make the anthropology of the present, and therefore I construct my work. This is the work you see as postmodern immigrant. When I finished my study at Dassat, I went to Spain, and I saw these migrants there. And yeah, this is our identity. Yeah, the blankets. And therefore, every single ele things I bought, I spent, like drink, whatever, I use the blanket to cover it. As a, uh, how do you say it? Bevice uh, tech. Yes, our conviction, which is really constructed about uh, to end up into lost and found object. But what you see is, is we will have to come back to this passport, but why? I start the work because I saw in the Spanish faces their, their expression, which is, what is this? And this is really this. Why? Because the borders are closed, human being is immigrated, and then I ask them, can I collect everything that they have? They say, no, we're going to send them to incineration. I said, no. We need the anthropological trace because this must be really documented. That's why I create all of them. I revamp them in order to create the museum because they don't want to create a museum of migration. Yeah. And my passport. <laughs> this is this is all my passports. This is the only thing left to me in my identity because you know when I finish the inbergening courses, they they said I have to take the Dutch passport but I have to give up my own passport. Uh, yeah, it was very interesting and very important. And that's why I decided this work, I will bring it on stage to perform it before it was only visual art. And it's then I start to make research about citizenship regimes in order to have some performative element to stage the work. To say everything is really interesting, I want to translate it to artwork, which is therapeutic, which is a material to, 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 to share, and to facilitate the interaction, because we need to interact. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, I'm curious to hear more about um, the post trajectory after you made this art. Have you been in touch with those men? Um, did they see the artwork? The spend. Um, yes. Um, did they, yes. were they compensated? Like what was the process? Yeah. Yeah, I start, I was exhibiting since I was 17, but the most ex beautiful exhibition in my life, I have it in Spain, in Sevilla. When I finished the pre-research of the artwork, it was very necessary to take it home, to show it to Senegalese. What is it, our identity? Identity. What is postmodern immigrant and how we are so-called with this migration? But from Senegal, I, I went to Argentina because since Europe become a fortress, I heard very beautiful story that the migrant, they, they took the boat and they turned off their engine, the engine, and the wind will take them to Brazil. And from Brazil, they walk to, uh, to Argentina. Why Argentina? Because Argentina is the only country in the world who applied the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You know, migrants, they have the right to travel to function. 
they have a precarity this paper. That was the reason why I went there to collect material, to have workshop. And then I returned at the place where I started the project, Sevilla, to have an exhibition. The most beautiful exhibition and full and the most important people that in the institution, they were there to, show, to look at the work, which is really, to me, it was interesting that now they realize we all have the tendency to be free to move in order to have the right to exist. Because they couldn't see that I have the right, they don't have the right, because simply they are from Africa. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. I hope I answer your question. <laughs> yeah. No, you actually you didn't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because, you know, I can go into the because during the exhibition, because uh, the people who attend the exhibitions, they were really intellect. I used the, the text of Lacan, Marcel Duchamp, in order to explain how European art from Duchamp, the 21st century, has switched on the European brain to understand art, the necessity of what art is. As so a what did it do for the, the man you yeah. photographed? The photograph. Yeah, like the man in the photograph that we just, that we just, just saw. What, Ooh, the what's photograph, in it I, for them? Uh, this is really controversial because I end up, I want to, I transform them into piece of work, object of art, in order to allow them to travel without a visa to save some life. Because when you have a say, every single artwork has a right to travel to museum. And since they become art object, they don't need necessarily visa. They need only certificate of authenticity. That's a yeah. beautiful statement. Yeah, it's but a, also it, painful because yeah, it's very painful. But this is it. This is uh, it's very important because you know, I don't say art. We can use it to to educate. It's wrong even education in art or research artists. We, you, we use art to inform, but it was very necessary for me to. And I work with this project with some really lawyers of Human Rights Watch. Yeah. They happen to be all white, and we interact. But it's a concept, creating a book, traveling around the world. Any single migrant who wants to migrate, mm -hmm. we transform you into a piece of work. And this was in the Museum of Dakar. Mm -hmm. I, I exhibit human existence. Yeah. Of course, some women, you will have to look at this history, because we are from a very beautiful place, and where our grandmothers, I will say, has put a lot of positive energy in us. Yeah, but maybe if I could mind, thank you so much. This is really a gorgeous way to answer this question, but maybe what I would like to say is what this explanation does for me is tell me that your work was communicating again, right? Like, why are you keeping these human beings in one place? How can I make them travel? You know what I mean? There is an act of communicating freedom, right? And I feel in your videos, especially, when you talked about the video, video that you showed about the white cube, there is also this imperative of moving beyond their existing structures. Could you maybe tell us how you use your, your videos, your content, your media platform, to move beyond what is already here, the ways that black people are seen? Yeah. Maybe we can show a bit of the video and then I'll freestyle. <laughs> Have you heard of Liquid Spaces? A freedom that is to be community? Freedom, hear me well, lies in the in-betweens, the margins. It is to say, a highly precarious state. 
In this precarity, our senses were heightened. Time widens in an ever-present experience of listening. The space that I call home is always reinventing itself at the border of every listener. Are you still listening? Are you, man? Watching the one who watches. No cage of an ideal in mind. We experience what it is to be borderless. To model our own terms for assigning meaning and thus become co-creators of our own experience, not just passive subjects to the imposed order. We learn to be more than two places at a time through osmosis, leaping through four-dimensional walls. It's a place of plurality, of where we decrypt the code. By using the alternate black cubes, we have made weapons of choice, creating non-linear circuitries where the past may as well be the future, decoding old codings and recoding new landscapes of meaning. Here, we make permanent negotiations. The key word is adapting. There is nothing real as such until we've anchored it and nurtured it through belief and custom. But once we have, it's already elsewhere, escaped. See, it's playful. Through ongoing deconstruction and remapping, we grow. But not in the sense of an evolution towards some ideal climax. We let go the idea of an end or a beginning. It's all here, opening new roads each day. I can't see it now. Drawing in with no conclusions. What we want is to explore new floors, knowing intuitively when to take and who to leave space for. The only permanence is to change. The rhythm is to break the rhythm. Our systems are frantic jazz and heightened electrical presence. So a bit of context, I should have done this before, but I realized that when it was already on. Um, so this project was specifically made to kind of reflect on our positioning in art institutions specifically as black people, people of color more generally, and um, how we relate to these spaces, how we um, navigate these spaces. And this is, uh, a second part, so the entire video is on YouTube with subtitles as well because there's French and Dutch in, in it as well. And so it's about this black woman who enters the institution for the first time as part of, you know, perhaps her new job that's all open for interpretation. Um, but, you know, this idea that we often have as people um, that are asked for the first time to do something in these great institutions, you know, you feel great about yourself, this is it, this is the beginning of my career, I'm going to make it, these people are going to see me. Um, so that's part one, and then she realized this is like a super, not just the space and the walls are not only white, it's white in, in all you know, the senses that we talk about whiteness, and that's where she feels uncomfortable, and she, she's haunted by the people who have gone before her, so the dancers and the voices that you hear, they are trying to contact her, trying to make contact with her to warn her for what's about to come, which is all the violence, um, you know, so the sim symbolism of performance art and dancing in front of a white uh, gaze and you know it hurts um, you know we try to to visibilize that to make that visible um, and so this is the part where um, we explicitly talk about how we um, how we um, not only not respond to that, but kind of create our own ways of being. So we've all, we, we often feel that we have to respond to, to whiteness, respond to the violence, kind of, and their, our entire existence is about responding, but not creating and doing things for ourselves. So this is where the messages come true about how we can create alternative codes and kind of hack this white cube and do our own thing. So that's what this particular part is about. So that's why it's, it's a bit trippy because, you know, it's, supposed to kind of trigger this creativity um, and then eventually she will escape this white cube and you know that's open open for interpretation but that's what it represents wow 
Thank you so much. I mean, for me, this video is interesting because I'm specifically working within the gallery space, right? And usually when um, black artists make it within a given scene, it's kind of immediately lifted out of their own community and thrust into the white cube, right? And I'm consistently thinking like, what is the beyond white cube, right? What is, how can you as a black creator make artwork that is not meant for the white cube, that is meant to distract that. Because usually when I enter museums, it's not like, oh, the white cube has been thought with. It, it's been the box that we are gonna put it in. You know, it's like when ball.com thinks about how they're gonna transport things. They have a box and the thing fits in the box. Sorry, ball.com. But like, it's this idea that every museum, every artwork that you make, somehow needs to fit into this box, right? But, but why? I why is that? I'm, I'm challenging that notion because I think where we still have to do a bit of unpacking and un decolonizing ourselves is in believing that whatever space we enter, we become, mm -hmm. we occupy it. I do tours, for example, unrelated to this, but in the Rijksmuseum, the National Museum, centered on black presence in the art. Well, the museum at first told me, well, there is none. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, this is the National Museum. This is the Rijksmuseum. Anything starts with the, it's the only one. And we are centering the glory of the golden age story here. So you won't find anything. I said, well, just give me access, and I'll use my museum card every day, whenever, however I want, to find that centered. And after a couple of months, I was able to create a whole experience that was centered on my experience as a black person, seeing myself in the most microscopic way. And the museum was like, we had no idea. There's a black person there. Well, he's always been there. But you weren't looking for him. So I'm saying that we infiltrate the space. We don't have to think about these notions because we are occupying it by the sheer presence of being there. And then we subvert it and turn it into what we want. And, and that's again, yes. not using the colonized language yes. for us to, we have to break free of just the way we even frame that, yeah. is what I'm suggesting. Not that you're wrong. No, 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 no. I can be wrong. But this is, I just uh, want to, I want to, I want to push us to move beyond this notion that we have to ask. Let's just, you know, that's what we're doing here, right? We're not asking. We're saying this is what we've created. You can like it or not. You can consume it or not. It is, it exists because I'm here. And because we know who we are, this is what I love about being an owl, an older, wiser learner. I don't give a shit. <laughs> There's a point where you just don't, it doesn't matter as much anymore. And I don't have to, I don't have to worry about does it fit? Will they like it? They're curious, they're gonna come. Right? I mean, I, I, do you guys disagree with me? Or, or am I way out of left field? No, it's, I was just thinking about the video I saw about the four dimension you emphasize in the video. There's in the narrative, you talk about four dimension. I, yeah, in, the, in, the, in your video, it's, there is four dimension uh, parameter. And I was wondering, is uh, it has to do with the space or the product as a movement? Or the situation in the drama, the floor, but I saw four dimensions. What are they? Huh? What, you what did you see as the four dimension? Yeah, because uh, to me, I, I was I'm very interested into uh, working in uh, extension of uh, the five dimensional is uh, sense of metonymy. It's connecting several disciplines, and dimension. Uh, yeah, it's a form of. Uh, two-dimensional, one-dimensional, three-dimensional, from verticality to, you know, we end up into installations mm. to get into atmosphere, mm. which is a comfort zone. Mm. Yeah, and it makes it easy for certain artists to function without having to really pre-answer the choosing of material. But in the video like this, this is the moment of four dimension. And this part is very interesting. It says a lot to me. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it did that for you. <laughs> yeah, you see, that's, 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 it's come back, you know, when you make artwork, 
you know, when you release it, you lost the control. It's not yours anymore. That is definitely true. Yeah, it this has really become important. something that, and then it was somebody um, commented on it during an interview, like a after talk, uh, somebody who was not involved and she had seen it one time and she saw all these things that I didn't even intend to put in there. So that's it. Yeah, it lives a life of its own. That's true. I'm super interested. Anyways, um, I'm going to leave the white cube alone. <laughs> because I feel it's been explored enough, right? And maybe where I want to return to is this idea of being a trend, right? I don't know if you have seen the, um, the inclusion now of African countries, but also the very much inclusion of African artists within museums. There is a nervousness, there is um, a hyper-focusedness on things that, I don't know, communicate Africanness, right? And I'm wondering, how is this being a trend? How are you counteracting it? How is it affecting you as a practitioner? Yeah, I will answer because this is, uh, yeah, I really disagree with what's happening now about art because they select the European, Asian, and they put the artists from different backgrounds to show what, what they are showing, what. Because, you know, from the moment we cannot answer the useful art, art. what is it for? Ça sert à quoi? Yeah, till now, you know, visual art with the extension till performing art, they never answer the question, what is it for? You know, but architecture answer it because architecture negotiates the pre-answers of negotiating the angles, the light, the accessibility, what is it for? Toilet is for your needs, you know? But art, from the moment we, we're trying to get to solve problem, which it doesn't exist, let's allow the confrontation. Because confrontation, confrontation is very, very important, important to find, to, 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 to select, select the, the, the philology. Philolog you know, philology, philology, philology is the terminology, the terminology of situation, situation what you don't understand. understand. We help you to understand the form of art. art. You know, you know we, we rewind, rewind again to Marcel Duchamp. He created create a form, form of new definition, definition to allow art, art to be to in be the, in the same, same ranks as science. Because they have the same model, which is culture. And, and for, for us, we complete it with culture. culture. If you don't have culture, culture your culture, culture will not be strong. strong. It means it's your narrative will be really based on comfortable experimental, experimental moment. moment. I, I personally, as an artist, I disagree. But what's happened, what happened, happened really, we have to allow the, confront, the confrontation. confrontation. Like, like we said, what, what is it for? for? And the and choosing of real material, material who has a pre-definite personage in the installation or in the surface or on stage, which is really important when we talk about art as an oeuvre I mean, I don't know exactly about Duchamp and his role, but what I would maybe like to bring the conversation to is this idea of not making art for art's sake. Right? right? I am I myself am a curator, curator and I encounter quite a lot, lot of black artists, artists who refuse this notion. This notion. They, they refuse to make, to make art, art just for the, for the sake, sake of making art. art. Right? right? They, they make, make art because, because there was BLM, because, because, because they're angry, angry because, because they want to communicate, communicate, because they want to take up space in museums, because they want to communicate and commune with their communities. So for so me, this idea, idea that, that, I mean, a lot of, um, if I may say, white people usually, usually do not know why they're making their art, art but specifically um, black people and the black condition within Europe. I, 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 I personally have not met an artist who begins without a why. I have to inform you more about Marcel Dishan. Marcel Dishan, I use it as a reference in modern art. Because this has, has allowed, allowed something which is really forbidden, forbidden where, where the institution took, took over the control of art. This he negotiated negotiate of, <coughs> let's say, Western, Western art. art. The only, the only model, model was allowed, allowed to be painted is the nude, nude, and the nude has to lie down, a female. female. But this he paints a silhouette, a woman, a woman 
walking on the stairs with the attitude. It was completely forbidden. It means the revolution, the form of art which is really independent, and the resistance of creativity and being free. You know, it doesn't matter the artist, but the artwork, what the artwork is answering, is very important. Of course, yes. of course. I keep also wondering at this point in time what was happening at least in Africa, which other artist was making the same, different directions maybe, revolutionizing art. Because I do understand Duchamp's implication, but I also sometimes tend to feel he's getting a bit of too much credit. But anyway, maybe something else that I would like to bring the... Um, the conversation too, is to ask in which ways that your practices right now, right? Where is the longevity, right? Let's come back to this because I feel, I am myself like, I'm also a curator, I'm a destabilizer, working in the margins, doing all these things. And sometimes we are creating situations, situations that have meanings, but sometimes I'm really worried that these situations are just situations, right? Every now and then there is impact, but where is the longevity? Can we be able in 50 years to give the torch to somebody else to build upon your practice? Well, what I said earlier I think speaks to that. Um, if you intend to create something that will be sustainable, then it has to evolve. If we're not evolving in our work, then it will eventually die, or it will be a distant memory as, oh, once upon a time. And I think what I love about the works that are represented here is it continues to change. Nothing stays the same. It cannot be static because we are not static. We are continuing to evolve. I am not the same artist that I was 10 years, years ago. I'm not the same storyteller that I was 10 years ago. I've changed, I've evolved because new knowledge has been produced that helps to inform the narrative that we are co-creating. The intentionality also, I think, has a lot to do with longevity. Um, going back to the, the, the question of who's it for, but why? What is your intention? Um, um, in Sites of Memory, memory maybe this would be a good place, place to play the, the, the trailer of Sites of Memory. Of memory. It's, it's about, about location, location, so the, so the geography, geography of the place. place. But, but every, every place, place has its own story and narrative. narrative. And, and the minute, the minute we, we left the, the you know, Amsterdam, Amsterdam and moved to other cities, cities we had we to had start all over again in terms of the research and understanding the peculiarity, the particularity of that place what's been what's hidden, hidden, what are we, what trying, we trying to amplify, to amplify? What, are what are we trying, trying to say, say? and who and gets, who to, gets say to say it. it. So we so are asking, asking the audience to shift the gaze, to, to look, look away from, from, from a perspective, perspective that they're usually, usually you know, the, the dominant, dominant narrative, narrative it focuses, focuses as, as um, um, looking, looking at, at the, the other, other, but now we're we're turning the table and we're looking at you. And you and now are, are the subject. subject. You're the You're object, object of our observation. observation. And, it and it makes people, people at first, first oh, oh, boy, I don't, I don't want to be looked, looked at. at. I'm, I'm here to look at you. you. We also we now even move, move to the point where we are engaging the audience in the experience. So they have activated where they have to become implicated in the story. You're not, You're not just, just a, a, st you know, just standing, standing by or, or an observer. observer. You, are you are now part of the story. story. It is your story. It's, your story. it's, not, it's not just about me. It's also about, about you. you. And, and where language, language, I don't know how much the, the language, language, you language you mentioned about, about the different languages. languages. It was also it was important, important that, that everything not be in Dutch, Dutch everything not be in English. English. It be in the language of the creator. What if I speak, my native language is Papiamentu, then why do I have to translate that for you in English? or Dutch. Dutch. You, can you can understand me if you just, just see me and, and look, look at, the, at, the at the embodiment of what, what I'm saying. saying. It's, it's so clear, so and in none, none of the performances, performances do we try, do we to, try to translate everything, everything. Or, or use, use one, one language. language, or use or one use medium, medium to communicate. communicate. So it's so visual, visual, it's, it's, it's spiritual, spiritual, it's music, it's dance, it's poetry. I started, I started off seven, seven years, years ago when I was, we co-created, co uh, co-founded Sites of Memory as the narrator, like I'm a guide, and we're, and we're passing the site of memory, and you, you as the audience, don't, don't know what's, what's going to happen next. next. That's, That's also, also the element of surprise. surprise. And, the and the city, city is, is the theater. theater. 
So, so people passing by with their baby, baby carriage, carriage, you don't know, are they, they in it or are they not? not? Are they a are part of it or are they not? They so there's so always this element of surprise. surprise. And, and three, four, three, four years, years ago, ago um, I'm, I'm not sure, sure who this idea was, maybe it was Katie or Jurgen Gadio, said, well, we need you to become a part of the theater. I said, I am. Said, no, 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 we want you to be in a costume. costume. We want we you want to have, have a name. We want you to, to, to have, you know, to, to, and I'm like, like, oh, you want me to be in it? it? I, thought I thought I was in it, but now, now I'm immersed, immersed it, as you'll see, see. I'm one of the characters in this performance. So my voice now not only is narrating a story, but I'm embodying the spirit of the past. I am the ancestor. So maybe this, can we show that trailer? Yes. No more silence. Our voices in our tears. Receiving the not knowing. The transparent is a comfort. Our bodies hold stories that want to be told. We are exactly where need be. Collecting the elements of change. If your glory is connected to violence, do not repeat. Our voices, transparent in our tears, seeking transformation to set us free. Did you notice all the locations where we were? Did anyone pick up where we were? What did you see? So we were in the Castle of Good Hope in South Africa. We were in the Schreckwart Museum. We were in Utrecht. And so we were traveling to all these places, infiltrating these institutional spaces that 10 years ago said, oh no, we, we don't talk about race, we don't talk about history, don't talk about slavery. And here we are, not just talking about it, but we're actually transforming and occupying spaces. So who said we can't do that? For me, this is really mind-blowing, I must say. Like, during the research, well, anyways, um, um, longevity. I just want to respond to Please all do. that I've seen and heard because I, this was beautiful. And, and, and I do wonder if these things cannot coexist, like being in a space and taking that space, occupy the space and not being there, being absent or like not being present as a conscious choice can also be, both can be transformative and I think we need both, but indeed ask ourselves why and in what way we, we do that. So that's one thing. Um, so how do our practices live on beyond us? That's a tough one. I think, I mean, working with videos that travel is one way of doing that. Um, but yeah, and I think a collective changes its form, um, ceases to exist, but then its work still travels. Um, I think that's the way I envision the legacy of Black Speaks Back. Interesting. I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Time-wise, I think we have 10 more minutes, and then the audience, right? The audience can feel free to raise their hands when they <coughs> wish to. But let's hear uh, um, your thoughts on longevity. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the term longevity, you know, like what we said, is the extension of existence. But I will bring it to the art praxis and art products because uh, uh, to me it's absolutely relevant when you are in the processes of projecting yourself, you know, you have to consider those forms of avant-garde. It is not necessarily the feature, but is it also not necessarily something you propose, but you suggest, your suggestion you know, the post-avant-garde situation. Because, you know, in longevity, where you're tending is so far that you don't even yet at the gate of the discovery. 
of uh, the mystery, the legend, the myth, and so on. And within a art praxis, I think uh, you might have a subject topic with the intention of making something precise, but you don't know what you're exploiting in the incidents, what's happening, what the spirit is bringing to you, the suggestion from the energy, and while making, while projecting yourself to, you, know, you might put yourself into the future, but you don't, you don't know where you're going, but that's why the, the post-avant-garde situation is very important, the proposition. It might be, you know, to be really, because they tell us, for those of you who are limited, who really stay in what you know, you will gain in, herit in heritage the science that you always ignore. It's by discovery, slowly. That's why we don't have to anticipate any etapes, which is not the intention. But the intention is to reach dimension of maybe four, five, aesthetic, and so on. I thought you wanted to say oh. something. <laughs> I'm, I'm so engaged. No, so I would, I'm just, you. yeah. Uh, I, I can, that resonates for me. I connect with Yeah, this. because uh, to me, the experience of uh, the, the concept of metonymy is several concepts which is really linked. Mm -hmm. but. Any time you finish a work, it's just another work. So you have a, always a purpose to continue. Mm -hmm. That's also longevity. <coughs> yeah. Because by work as postmodern immigrant, mm -hmm. I end up into immigrationism. Mm -hmm. And which is, what is immigrationism? Is, uh, yeah, we might flirt, of course, still with anthropology, but the recycle. Mm -hmm. You know? We recycling ourselves. And couldn't longevity also be if it inspires new creators, yes. right? That the next generation, I, I, I'm still, I'm still moved by getting comments from people who experienced something we did five years ago and say, "You inspired me to create this." Well, that's now longevity because it's going to extend into another generation. It's going to move. It's going to move the conversation forward. BLM, um, going back to what you said earlier about Black Lives Matter, it amplified mm -hmm. a movement that had already been afoot decades before, mm -hmm. but it was not as globally visible. And that one movement started by these three you know, ladies mm -hmm. became global and made what we were all doing much more visible, I think. It didn't start the movement, it just amplified it. So cannot, I think that can also be thinking about longevity in that way is if it inspires new generations to create. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what that's going to look like. And that's the, the mystery. That's the beauty of it. And to make change. And to, and to change. Yeah, to make change. Absolutely. To make really change. Yes, that's to make change. That's part, right? Yes. Interesting. When I was thinking about this question personally, I was thinking about ideas of the institution you know, I personally like work within or in between or outside institutions. And I'm always thinking, what a nice way to just get money and do whatever you want from the Dutch government. You know what I mean? In, no, we don't. <laughs> because no, no, we don't get it. <laughs> Please do share. <laughs> Just you get know, money and do what you want. Just get money and do what you want. In a way, like sometimes I enter, especially um, new institutions, upcoming, recently funded institutions, that these can find a way to function in this way, right? So when I think about longevity, especially within my practice as a curator, I'm like, oh, I can start a little curatorial studio, register it, and then continuously branded or created in such a way that it's continuously funded, it continues, it goes on, it invites various people to come in, it creates longevity, even if sometimes it doesn't have the biggest impact, but it's there as a resource to be like tucked into whenever it's needed, and it goes on for a long time, and it rides on the same tax money that all the other Dutch institutions ride on. <laughs> 
So where do we sign up? Yeah. <laughs> count, count us in. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting you, because this is the, the problematic of art practice now. Mm. Institution, subsidy, get the money and do, and without the money you will never be able to express yourself. Yeah. Or you're waiting for, and yeah. listen, they will give you the money to insult them. And the institution, maybe they tell you, you know, we are working on this topic. Just example, stupid example. But what's happening is, you know, we shouldn't contribute on the, the killing of the weapon as art. It's atomic energy. And if we allow it next time, another stupid premier minister will come and call the artist lazy bastard because you are not useful. Uh, it's because that, you know, you miss to, to constantly define your praxis is very important, the definition of art, yes. And which is really, you have to stay next to it. And the definition is to link it with what society is tending to, to go through, which is important as a medium. But from the moment that, you know, they allowed you to become an artist from being a lawyer or whatever, and you don't have any skill of, as a creator, but you become an artist like you know, the most coded artist, he's, he's not an artist, he's a trader. He manufactured the artwork, he become rich, famous, and all what artists are going through, he just make it. Why? Because of the institutions and what artists accept, which is really important. It's, uh, we have to avoid being in the mass, and we accept to make art forever to inform. I'm going to open it up to the audience. Yes. This is deep. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not engaging, but I think it's deep. I don't Indeed, know you, already deep have, <laughs> you already have a question. Please. Yes, I have two questions, actually, oh for uh, Mrs. Tosh and Umar here. But as a gentleman that I have, I will be starting with the lady here. If you don't bother, of course. Um, Mrs. Tosh, this is fantastic hearing you speaking, but uh, you mentioned something very interesting to me. Um, from working into financial institutions for many years. Uh, my question, you mentioned about uh, the ownership, institution, and legacy. So I believe you're talking about generational legacy of your work or even the institution itself. Yes. My question is, how do you, what, what is the process you go through in order to ensure that? Because I understand one thing, is that the one who pays is the one who calls the tune. That's a, that's a good question. Um, f I think it's helpful to know that my background before <laughs> coming to the Netherlands and considering myself an academic um, culture historian, I was in the corporate world. I come out of financial services, global marketing, advertising, branding. So I, I understood institutionally how a brand is created. So I didn't have any money when I started the tours. I had less than money, I had minus money. But I understood how to create a brand. So there's a saying, I'm not sure if it's Maya Angelou who said it, using the master's tools, uh, thank you, Audrey Lord, <laughs> um, to dismantle the master's house. We cannot. We, cannot. we should not. Yeah. I did. Said that we should. Audrey Lord said that we should not. Thank you. I did it. Sorry, Audrey. <laughs> I used my training in the corporate world um, to create a platform. So I knew how to do that using social media, using mediatization of, of my, my representation, of my presentation. And that served me well. Because when I had minus money, what I learned from just doing that is that you don't have to have money. So we, we're dependent, again, on this sort of colonial apparatus to justify how we do what we do. But I, I had minus money and I found um, allies. Now, not everybody's gonna agree with this because some people say, oh, you know, this is where Afro-pessimism and me kind of go separate ways. We cannot have allies outside of our diaspora because then who owns what we're producing? But I think it's important to create communities. And communities can come from many different sources and many different generations and many different cultures and many different histories. And that's how I built what I started 10 years ago and it's still here. 
when he said, oh, well, she'll be done in a couple of years. She'll be gone back to the US. And I think we have to use all the tools that we've been given or been forced upon us. Why not? And create something that I now say, it's not mine. Like you said, when it's done, it takes on a life of its own and it will live on because it's gonna inspire the next generation. Mm -hmm. So that's really, did I cheat? Well, maybe. I don't know if that's called cheat. That's well, you do, actually. But I used what I had what, because I didn't have everything I, I needed. And I'm glad I didn't rely on the government subsidies because then it's about who owns the past and who controls the narrative. And I was determined that that was not going to be done because I was using the funding and they have criteria and you got to make sure you stay. And not the saying that we don't get funding for sites of memory. We do. But I think we have proven over the years enough that the narratives that we have produced is not about demonizing one history over another. It's not about creating, shifting the gaze so that now we are the one who is the, the colonizer and you're now the colonizer. It's about creating different narratives so that multiple voices can speak and be heard and be centered. And so it's a, it's a fine line, it's a dance, a two-step dance. Sometimes I'm leading, sometimes I'm following, but I'm always creating communities and I think my intention always is to have, um, uh, to not just be, a, a, you know, I'm me, I did it all myself. I couldn't have done it without the communities that, that are around me. So I hope I've answered your question. Great, that's perfectly, yes. Maybe a workshop for other people's willing also to follow your path. That's really, really suitable. But I'm just saying it. Okay. <laughs> Omar, it's your turn. Yeah. Um, talking about um, we speak, they listen, but they don't talk. Um, what are you expecting from the European side to express? Because uh, understanding the European medieval history that still has traces nowadays, I think it's really challenging to um, open a conversation whereby both parties will be able to openly and freely communicate. But what do you want to hear or listen from their ends? Yeah, uh, you know, there is a, a parameter of uncomfort zone. Because, you know, if, uh, if one talks plain or, or lamentate, you know, and the other one will always listen to avoid confrontation maybe or interaction. Yeah, there is multiple layers of recurs. Opening up is very important. But if you have the tools to not justify yourself, because for instance, when we talk about depending on the institutions, all what we complain maybe the institution will respond or develop its strategy. Or you complain about racism, facing a racist person, for instance. What is really important is, to me, once we happen to have a debate like this, the interactive must be really fluid from both sides. I could explain one part has a multiple weight of traumatism and therefore keep on feeding his view about the disaster, about the drama, while we're still talking and it become it reached the level of upset which is really <clears throat> important to use art as it is there, so we all face it, not facing each other or, you know, having this debate of confrontation, which is really, it's a very violence, maybe. You hit me, and I cannot hit you back. And I, sometimes I even may not talk about it. And that's why art is very important medium, where we all really target the, the subject there, and where we can put our 
propositions. Because it's not very easy to, to have a session of therapy once we are really corrective, <laughs> you know. And I, I'm afraid that, you know, we will have to go through it. Um, yeah. In the, as a dishwasher, you know, the dishwasher, this uh, cerebral, this, you know, the, while the machine is turning, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not only, you shouldn't be only cerebral. Yeah, it has to be part of emotions yeah. and, and so on. Let's put it that way. Beautiful. I mean, this has so many implications, but I'm going to let the joy in the audience, yes. please. Raise your hand whenever you want to say something. Would you like to be recorded? Yeah, sure. Cool. No, that's fine. Nobody asked me. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. OK, the debating. Um, oh, my. <laughs> yeah. OK. Because uh, we studied together. Okay. So uh, in a white racist institution. And we loved being told we couldn't. Do you remember? Yes. We loved that fight. It was like, come on then, bring it on. We're artists, we're selfish. We're gonna do this, we're gonna claim our space. We are fucking owed. <laughs> this is mine. And then we got into the cube and then we realized, oh, bloody hell, where's the wire? Where's the video feed? Uh, could you maybe hang that up there so that the curtain doesn't fall down on me? And that process that we called art, because it's never about the finished thing, it's always about the process for us. We fell into it, we, we lost our color, we lost our names, we lost the ability to think, oh, it's time to eat. We just need to get the installation up. There's a deadline, the posters are out there. We, we're going to have art critics come in, they're gonna judge us. This is a universal problem. Black, white, green, it don't matter. That is the formula of art, and art critics that control the world of art say this artist will make it and that artist won't. We owning our own spaces to create our own art starts becoming this big loving, this big therapy. Let's have a group hug. Let's say everything's okay. But when we come down to making art, we're actually very competitive with each other. I've had women of color cut me down because I've sold more tickets for my show than they haven't. And we're occupying the same building. This building. This very building. So what I'm saying is, is that there's nothing wrong with competition. It makes us angry, hungry. It makes us want to make more. My question is, how are we going to get this group of people to make more? Because I want to make more. And I don't care who I have to fight. I love it. It gives me energy. But I want to do it with my contemporaries, people of my skin color, people of my background, people who are immigrants, <coughs> and most of us are in this room. So I want us to claim more spaces like the Buckhouse, like the Bali, like the Stadtschauberg, like the Rijksmuseum. I think Jennifer's right. I think we've got to get in there and work the machine from the inside, and I want to know how. Give me some ideas, please. Manifesto of uh, avant-garde. Manifesto of avant-garde. This is so interesting. Thank you so much for the wonderful question. And I feel like it brings us back to literally diversity and inclusion work. You know, beyond anything, I feel like it's being included, but also, I mean, I must return to the things that you said. I'm sorry, I'm selfish, selfish moderator. But what I want to maybe say is this thing of um, don't fight, don't be in conversation, open yourself up. And 
this is going towards black people, right? Open yourselves up, don't be restricted. But I feel that this is such a big ask, right? If you find yourself in a, a white cube, if you find yourself in a white house, if you find yourself in white clothes, if you find yourself on the losing side for centuries, I don't know in how long you can then start to open yourself up for this, I don't know, experience. But I don't know if you have questions. Uh, can I just, uh, yeah, please, yeah, she's getting cold, huh? yes, please. <laughs> It's getting cold indeed. Yeah. Uh, no, I actually want to respond. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. And I think if that works for you, like, you know, the competition, the sense of competition, if that makes you productive, then that's great. Um, I just wonder if we should compete each other, especially as people of color, especially as, as women of color, over crumbs, white people's crumbs. I don't think that's empowering, at least not to me. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think. You know, you talked several times about um, kind of unlearning. Well, in the beginning, you said unlearning the, the, the c language of the colonizers, but then later you talked about, and I understand why you had to do what you had to do to um, establish yourself to then use the master's tools. Um, but I think, like, my personal opinion is that we should really not use the master's tools and not use the master's ways to get in that position of the master because who is it benefiting at the end of the day except for our individual selves? Like it's not helping us as a community. Like if you're there, there's no reason to speak of a community, a black community, uh, a people of color, women of color because you are no longer among them. You're competing them. You're, you're not seeing them as, as your ego. I do think it's what we need to do is hold each other more accountable, being critical about each other so that you know, that's if we if we are critical about each other, we are challenging each other. That means that we're also challenging ourselves, and perhaps that will be enough competition. You know, um, kind of maybe that will fire something up to make us more productive. But to be in competition with each other, I think we have enough of that, um, especially because in institutions we oftentimes can only be one, maybe two. You know, and we are competing each other instead of competing against you know, the mediocre white artists that are out there and that are taking all the space. So I just... Yeah, I was just being an antagonist, actually, because the point is, is that uh, the, that, that is the very point. Sorry. Uh, th that is the very point. Mm -hmm. um, I was thrown out of the black women's group because technically I wasn't black. Yeah, but maybe this is another conversation. And, well, no, but, but that's what I mean. It's, yeah. it's, if, 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 it, if it is another com conversation, it leads back to the same conversation. Because if you want to build a community, how inclusive can we be? And because you feel excluded, do you feel that we have to be more competitive? Not competitive, but I don't want to go off and make a, a brown women's group. Because the subsidy people use that as a divide and rule. Exactly. It's that, about that's the you point. know what I think what's missing from this, this thought process is we again seeing ourselves as minorities. When we think about this, the way uh, the zone of being has been defined as Europe defined it, if you're not white, you're below the zone of being, and therefore you are all in this, the, the, oh, the othered. As, was it um, Fanon, who are, I'm maybe mixing up my um, philosophers, but when we're talking about the native, native only exists in a European context, is when, like you said, you didn't know about being uh, black until you left Africa and came to Europe. This idea that you're competing with I think this, I'm not de de negating that that's your experience, but it benefits the society, the dominant society, to make us believe that that is what's really happening. Yeah, right, as long as, as, long as uh, we fight among ourselves, that's about control. And then we don't, they don't have to worry about who they're gonna parse out and decide who's gonna win. Look at them go. 92% of the world population are not white. 
but we never think about ourselves as the majority. And as long as we don't see ourselves in that way, then of course we're going to be feeling like we're in the crab in the barrel and we're competing and there's only a crumbs. At the I want us to break free from that. That's really, really, that's the challenge of being here is let's break what would happen in our possible future if we stop believing that we have less or lack. I mean, what would happen if we as a community left here use the direct action to change something, to create something, whatever it is? I'm just thinking if we leave here and it was like, oh, that was such a lovely conversation, wasn't that great? And we don't do anything with it, then it was just, what was it for? Going back to the question of why are we here? Why are you here? What did you hope to come and accomplish being here? You wanted to hear something to inspire you. Maybe you wanted to debate. What's the, the intention that I think fuels the possible future? That's just, I just want to pose that as a question to you. We're now observing you. They're taking your time. Huh? Yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I've got very inspired by you, Jennifer. You really inspire me. You just triggered something about. Oh, sorry. Oh yeah, sure. You can feel. Um, but it's a question for you guys all because um, for me, I see art as a way of expression, expression as in dance, expression as in music, expression as in art, colors, and for my experience, when I'm in a difficult time. I find my tools to express or to heal myself, to find a spa safe space. But now the thing that you all mentioned is you all created something that was missing to fill the gap. So now I'm also in the journey that I'm missing a lot of things which constitution like the Dutch government. When you're having some troubles in your personal life, I'm a I'm very open person because I know that's good for me, it's help. I got fired by a company because I didn't fit in the white, not the white, I didn't fit in the culture. But that's fine because I really appreciate it because now I have the time to figure out what I want to do. But I don't want to work for somebody because then you are fitting in a box. But how do you amplify the freedom to create something because otherwise if you want to have the money from the government then you have to fit in a box oh she's very sad she's very depressed okay we can help you with a campaign that's amplifying the depression topic and you can get a money to do that but maybe i don't want to do that maybe i want to um sorry but my question is this so how can you how what would you advise somebody who wants to create something if we have a lot of ideas to just bring it out and to bring it back to the community because that's something very important. If you get the art, art is an expression to represent youth people, generation itself as well, to bring it back, like food, like knowledge, like therapy, because they are scared they don't see somebody who looks like me to talk about certain uh, subjects. So sorry if it's too long, but yeah, no, my, question, yeah. Yeah, my question is how do you express that kind of art in a positive way? Because we all know it's very easy to find the negative stuff about things, but let's try to amplify the positive stuff. So if I see a movie, then it shows me that, hey, you can do it, I can do it with the money that I get. I can travel the world and help the children to know that they have also have the power to create something. So thank you very much. Please. Wow. Um, thank you for sharing that, being vulnerable enough to share that. My philosophy has always been if it doesn't exist, then, then, then I'll create it, or if it doesn't exist in your community, then you must create it. Every great work started with an idea, and it didn't start with necessarily an idea and a pot of a golden pot to help you build it. But I also believe that there are communities of people that think like you or have a vision similar to yours, and you can find them. Finding that community is important because when you're alone, it feels like like a mountain you have to climb by yourself. It's this 
massive thing that how are you going to get around it how are you going to get over it but if you have a you know a chain of people who one hand is lifting the other hand that's i think really important to finding that 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 comfort in your community, wherever that is. And it only has to be one other person um, to, to initiate an idea. Um, I also think that the inspiration comes when you get, you know, and sometimes angry enough. I'm like, okay, you told me I can't? Well, that's when I'm gonna do it. I'm, you know, not being afraid to fail forward. I mean, you have to leap off of this building and there's nothing, there's no net, there's nothing to catch me, I'm gonna fall, I might die. Yeah, you might. But look at the look what joy you get from just taking the leap. Once you've done it, you're like, oh, that wasn't that bad. Don't be afraid to fail forward. Don't be afraid to to lose something because what you might gain in the, in the process of what you've lost, that job, it probably did you a favor. Think of how you silenced yourself every day. I've been there. Twenty years I worked in the corporate world, and I was dying a slow death. The best thing that ever happened to me was was uh, the, the 2008 financial crash. We were forced out, and I was forced to get out and then forced to do something else. I couldn't get another job in that field. So I thought, oh, you know what? I always wanted to go to school. I'm gonna be a coming academic. At my age, yeah, an owl. I'm gonna, and guess what? Once I made the intention that's what I was gonna do, all the resources I need came to me. Manifesting is real. I got money from places I'm like, oh my God, I should have done this a long time ago. And so I'm saying to say is set the intention and be driven by it. Let it consume you. Finding your community. You're, we're your community. We're here. You have access to us right now. I mean, not that we have all the answers and can get you where you want to go, but utilizing the, the, the resources that are right in front of you is a starting point. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It, if people knew that I was homeless in the Netherlands the first five years. Homeless. Creating tours, I'm social media, smiling. I had, was couch surfing. I was literally, for the first five years, I had no clue how I was going to survive. But I didn't give up. And I think that's the other. Don't give up. Don't be afraid to lose everything, to find everything. And that, for me, it took five years to find my footing, and, but people helped me along the way. And I, didn't, I had to swallow a lot of my pride in order to keep going. Being a co-author didn't mean I had money. <laughs> so don't give up. Don't give up on your dream, because it's meant for you to do something with it. Beautiful. Yeah. There's a... Uh there's one question in the back here. Um, yeah. yeah. And I maybe wanted to, because Jennifer asked a question to the audience as well, and I was listening, and I maybe want to give a short, uh, what can we do when we leave the space? Maybe one suggestion, and I give it to the back. Uh, yeah, it's okay to film me. Yeah. And is it okay to film you too? Sure. All right. Then we know for us. But um, I think what is important when we talked about the white cube, getting in, getting space, artists, I think a lot of the infrastructure when we try to build community. At the same time, the infrastructure we use is quite individualized in the sense that a lot of us have to do it as a freelance, right? We enter, we get paid as an ind individual legal entity, and then you leave. But how does it, uh, how can you make it collectify? So for instance, what we try to do with our foundation every time uh, a white cube or a white institution tries to hire us or dress their window differently or whatever, we try to ask them, what are you going to give back to another table that we are trying to create? And that table then can give back platforms. So for instance, you have to have perspective. So I think also when we are legally, we are talking or speaking or, you know, uh, from a collective uh, place, we are making the art, but also how are we organizing our own infrastructure that it do doesn't become an individual empowerment in, in that sense. So I think there, we can think of creative ways, how can we, I call it sometimes set set pay activism, but the infrastructure is still individual. How can we do that? Because white institutions, if I would have a contract with the white institutions, for instance, at the Buckhuis, I'm worth 80 euros per hour, um, but I don't get that salary because part goes to the institution, right? But how do we think of this way? Like how do we, when we work, work for a collective that is 
independent. And I think that can maybe the question you ask something we can think about collectively as individualized infrastructures. I don't know. That uh, was something. Um, we spoke a lot about art, and there's so much to say about art and um, about successful art and successful artists, which is which are two different things. Um, we can choose to aim for commercially successful art. We can choose to make our best work of art, and all the and, dur and during that we want to live our best life. But all those goals sometimes they require different different approaches, and sometimes they can be combined and sometimes not. Um, I think if I return to the position of the artist, the greatest gift that artists have is the ability to create. And I think that in order to um, step out of a certain narrative, we cannot afford ourselves to stay at the level of reacting to reacting what is already there. And I think we should sometimes take a step back to really step into creating mode that includes all of our being, that includes um, um, our fabrics, our history, the visions that we see, to see us as a point of departure in the cosmos that we are. The creator in ourselves within the creation and the creator. I think that is a road to give, um, to be the most impactful as artists, as setting the tone. Yeah, well, it's very interesting, yes. Uh, what can I add? Because it's, uh, we take it as advice for the longevity. It's, a, it's an added value to understand the practice of art, to be aware of the central moment of where you are as a creator and the, the, the privilege, the opportunities, and the risk. It's very important. And that's why I, there is a, just allowed me to explain one of the very interesting project I attempt to, to Berlin was about awareness because uh, it was in 2003. Berlin was uh, the capital of art in Europe. They used the, the, the body of the city as a medium. And what, what is Berlin actually? It's where we divided Africa. It's where everything took place. And it's the occupied zone in Europe where America is. And beside that, we, we end up into thinking as African artists, the deberlinization of Africa. Because the whole system of Africa was set up in Berlin. And why I'm giving this example, because it's very daring and uh, open to choose that controversial topic as a, to use Berlin as a medium to expose yourself, to open a discussion is the conflict within Europe, Occident, and the conflict with outside of Europe. That artist has a privilege to, to have access to that particular situation and to, to set up a narrative. But to my point of view, the intention must be always, once you construct your artwork, the tendency of your suggestion you know, what you, what, you, what you giving. Like tonight, we're trying to give you really good food to think about. And <laughs> I think when you get home, you know, I hope it will take maybe 20 to two hours to digest, which is really important. And that's the, the use of art. And to complete what you're saying is just, we have to understand that it's not a profession. And if you accept to go to academy to learn art, forget about it. You learn how to make art, maybe, the understanding. And all those layers must be really identified for the institution to guide intentionally the new coming artists to, to contribute to the construction of the society, which is really deconstructed in a really massive manner because of all these 
slogan of diversity, which is nonsense because we're already diverse. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's deja vu, you know? And, uh, you know, we can talk about, but the thing is, your intervention is really added value as advice to understand your position and what you do for it. And also, this nice lady, you see your decision. To me, when I was facing to do things, I, I took the minimum, the most, you know, needle and the fire to knit. You know, this gesture is very small, but it's very important for your own plexus to define your way, but you define it. That's so nice. Maybe, um, oh yeah, we have one last question. Oh, yeah. Hi, um, thank you. I wanted to ask uh, to you, Emily. Emily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see uh, you have a black speaks back and you are uh, giving a bit of uh, context of the video you had shown of the white box and you also indicated that it's about being limitless and creating your own narrative. And my question is, why then uh, black speaks back to what, why? Why speak back and why not just speak? That's a great question. <laughs> So as I said before, the organization was launched in a very specific context years ago when you know, Belgium didn't really have any critical debate surrounding you know, blackness, minority perspectives who were completely absent in the public arena, public debate, um, media, everything. And Black Speaks Back was indeed responding to that absence. So we wanted to, you know, take, we wanted to be, um, to fill up as a, a, an emptiness in public debate and, and mainstream media. But in the process, we became something in ourselves, in, we became a, we became a thing in itself. So we don't necessarily, not necessarily, we don't really respond to whiteness anymore. Um, but I mean, the name is there. So that's just an evolution that we went through. But it's, it's a great question, and we definitely have grappled with this, with this question ourselves, but this is part of the legacy. We once spoke back. We will always be responding to something, even if it's to critical questions within our own community, but we might not always be responding to whiteness anymore. Great. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> yes, this is it. I love this room. Right. <laughs> it's really amazing. I want to thank you all for the lovely conversations, the openness, the sharing of your practice. It's been really um, enlightening. And I want to thank the audience too for being here and uh, being part of the program that was organized by Afrispectives. Yeah, and it's under um, Arts of Resistance uh, program. And I know that um, on Sunday, is it? On Sunday, you have a program. Do you want to um, yeah, back the program? Uh, Jürgen Gario, who is one of the co-creators uh, uh, with me in Sites of Memory, and he and I are facilitating a workshop, a writing workshop. Uh, it's Sunday at 1. <laughs> and you can, I think there's going to be something on, that's going to be shown shortly, where you can go and register if, if there's still space available. Uh, it will be from one until four, uh, and we were we're going to be. I think exercises is probably a very mild word, but we're going to be pushing the boundaries of memory, ancestral memories, invoking them, trying to retrieve them, recover them, using our memories as a as a as a tool for creating, for writing, for producing, and I think it'll be very really exciting. Uh, Jurgen and I have some great ideas on uh, dialogues that we will initiate, and it will not be a teacher-student kind of thing, so don't come expecting to learn from us. We will be co-creating and learning from and unlearning from each other. So that's Beautiful. what I'm excited about. Beautiful. Um, uh, I'm going to end it here. Thank you so much for coming. Much. I've been taking over from Guillaume. I hope I did a good job for those who yeah. came. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is it.
right, uh, we are finished. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>